Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association today. And who doesn't like this title? Here's how I'm investing as a family office. Now, I don't mean me personally. It's our special guest, the return of Marty Gross, family office and financial professional. Marty, welcome back to the show. Nice to be here. Great. So let me give a little context to the audience. Uh, you've been a very successful investor, uh, both personally through your family office and through your professional endeavors for a long time. With all due respect, that's tremendous. Uh, what you have that many maybe younger investors don't yet have is you've seen good markets, great markets, average markets, and every now and then some really, really bad ones. So understanding investing over time. Uh, so we had Marty on actually twice, but I think one was a private setting, uh, but once more formally last summer, where he discussed a little bit of his investment philosophies. We went over uh, questions I had on asset allocation, and it's rare to get someone of Marty's success uh, both as a professional and even more importantly, as a direct investor and family office himself to be open relative to what's working, what's not working, what we're getting in, what we're getting out of. So I felt now it's about eight or nine months after that, where I think somewhat uh, coming to, I'm not going to use the word end, but much more of a positive outlook relative to COVID. And we're both in the New York area. So we'll have feedback on what we're seeing in New York City, the good and the bad. And I think it'll be great to get a perspective how things might have changed from Marty's perspective over the last, again, really since last summer. So Marty, what, why don't we get right to it? I think my audience, because I interview so many macro thinkers and economists, no jokes about economists <laughs> and college professors that teach finance without actually being in the field of working and going through it. But we'll save that for a different time. Big picture in terms of macro. What do you read? Who do you listen to? What do you watch? How do you get your big picture information? Um, well, thank you. It's nice to be here again. Um, we don't have any great uh, unique sources when it comes to that. Um, most of the information that we think is going to be important for a macro understanding is in the public domain. Everything from Squawk Box and all the other different business shows to the journal and just watching the news. Um, so we don't have any particular insights that we think would differ from, um, from most people that are just trying to pay attention to what's going on out there. What we do try to do is to relate what we see as going on out there to particular investment themes. And that does affect, um, does affect how we will allocate our dollars to some extent, especially um, after what we saw last night, as I would characterize as a, an event with potential significant macro results, and I say potential because it's not clear exactly how much of what was discussed will actually happen. Very good points. We'll probably jump into that in a second. I'm going to press on a little bit and simply, no, Angelo, I don't do those. And I hinted at it in my diatribe before I asked that question, but whether on the professional side or on your personal side, are there economists and macro thinkers that you subscribe to, that you pay, that you listen to, or not really? There, there's nobody that we subscribe to that we pay for that purpose. They're one of the best sources we have um, to help us think through allocations and, and particular investment decisions, whether it's manager decisions or allocation decisions, um, are the various managers we work with. So for example, if we invest in the secondaries business in private equity, sure. and we have a very close relationship with the manager, we're very well informed as to which other managers in that sector we may or may not want to invest with because many times our manager will sell to them and they would, they could, we could, they could give us information about, I would, I would never invest with them because I would never pay for my stuff what they're paying for it. So one, one place we have um, pretty good insight into things is valuations. Um, and so a lot of the sources that we have in terms of what's going on now um, are some of the people that we've actually invested with and um, are on the ground in those particular asset classes. Yeah, that's a good point. Since you're so active as an LP, you get a chance to interact with some really smart, successful people. 
of course you get in and out of some, but you develop both personal and business relationships and you're getting kind of access to some of the things I'm talking about from people who directly, I guess you could say, have their boots on the ground. Uh, still staying a little bit in the broader theme, uh, and this is very obvious during COVID and as we're again, hopefully coming out, there's been a tremendous amount of spending by the government, AKA money printing. And I do mean a tremendous amount following, I guess, some of the principles of modern monetary theory, MMT. And again, you're someone who's in the trenches, not a, uh, a professor economist that's studying the history of it. Not to say that there may not be some value from that, but come on, what beats someone who's actually in the trenches? What do you think of this? What could be the short and the long-term impact? Yeah, look, um, I think about that in the context of other variables, hmm. okay? So it's absolutely true what you say, without a doubt, that they're printing a huge amount of money, okay? Um, they're also raising taxes. That is going to be another one of the major macro variables that will affect a huge amount of investment decision going forward, right? We don't yet know the magnitude of those increases to the extent there will be increases, okay? We don't know whether the tax on long-term capital gains for individuals is gonna go up, probably. Will it go to 28%, which is the number that seems to be batted around by many people that have studied this, which seems to be the efficient number, such that that is the highest tax you can impose on these types of transactions before you start collecting less revenue, because people will adjust their behavior to um, accommodate or, or adjust to different tax increases. So yeah, let's point. assume, so we don't yet know whether it's gonna be 28% or in the low 40% range. And I'm so far, oh. I'm only talking about federal. So one of the things that's very, very relevant to us in terms of trying to understand what's coming down the pike for the next couple of years is absolutely the money printing you're talking about. 100%. It's absolutely the tax rates. Okay. It's absolutely at least, and this has significant implications for where we'd invest, what they do with the return of the SALT deduction. Will it be, uh, will it come back and will it be uncapped? Right. Okay. Clearly the thoughts on inflation are linked to the money printing. Okay. They're clearly setting up a potential crisis owing all of this money as they printed if interest rates materially increase because the payment on all of this new debt will crowd out spending in all these other areas okay if interest rates go up that will clearly or when they go up we don't know how much um, that will definitely have an effect on growth stocks we don't know how much of an effect it will have on that right um, and so i look at the printing of the money as one of many macro factors, I've listed many of the others, that in different ways are gonna interrelate with each other and have a significant effect on how we, for example, will allocate our capital. A couple of the other factors I would just mention um, is um, international from the perspective of how we are perceived by China and Russia and North Korea and Iran because it is possible that if we project the wrong um, posture overseas, um, we could have an extreme event. What do we do if China decides to take Taiwan and dare us to do something about it, go to war with China, question mark? What do we do if Russia moves into the Ukraine? What do we do if North Korea gets problematic in a much worse way going forward? And what do we do if we fail as I think is more likely than not to get what we want out of the Iranian negotiations. So one of the things, and this affects our cash position, is how do we think, and it's very, almost impossible to put a probability on this, how do we think about the possibility of an extreme event as part of all these different macro factors that go into how we're actually changing our allocation? But we must wait and see what the rates are, what the tax rates are, before we can come to a conclusion on that.
Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty deep perspective, Marty. I'm glad you were elaborating on that. I do tend to be a little bit of a macro thinker, so I do like kind of the big picture and then focus in on some of the micro. A couple of comments on things you said, and I only mean this partially tongue-in-cheek. There's a degree of truth to it. Why do we pay taxes at all if the government can print money at will via the MMT, like I said earlier, Without inflation, now that relates to the velocity of money. There's a whole bunch of factors there that was only partially meant to be tongue in cheek. Although think a little deeper about it. There is a level of truth to that, which brings up again, the tax picture. I mean, I'll go on a little deeper. It's banks that create money, not the Fed. I mean, you could go a little back and forth on that. Until the money is lent out, it's not really in the system creating velocity, if I could use that word. So you brought it up uh, to give people context where the 29th of April, last night, the president, President Biden spoke. Obviously, taxes were a big part of it. You did loop that in into uh, your overview of macro. Why don't you dive a little deeper into what you heard and what may be reality as it moves forward and how that may impact your investing picture? Sure, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Let's look at the impact of COVID and the reaction to COVID. Okay, so let's talk about New York City because I'm a little bit familiar with New York City and I'm a little bit familiar with, with uh, you know, Southern Florida. Okay, so data points. Okay, um, we all on the call know there's an issue with office space. Nobody knows exactly how much of a demand, how much demand will come back to where it was pre-COVID. So it's a question mark. So that we don't know. What we do know, without doubt, about office space is that during COVID, a huge number of people learned how to very successfully and comfortably work at a distance. So that has been a behavioral change that will be permanent, although we don't know the degree, because of COVID. So when you look at New York City, you see an office space issue. We don't know. And the positives for New York is that it's New York, it's unique, and it will always come back. I don't disagree with people who say that. But it's also true that right now, New York has at least three serious problems. The first issue is the office space problem. No one yet knows how much demand there will be as many places leave for many reasons. The second problem is the high tax situation in New York, which is getting worse. And the third is the political. If we have another mayor like this mayor, those are his views do not tend to warm the hearts of many, and they have alternatives. So, at, at, and, and we also have the crime problem. So those are three, maybe four factors yeah, right. that are weighing against that that are that many other cities have. Okay, and then and but so one of the effects investment wise of that is that we invest with someone who purchases defaulted mortgages in New York. They're commercial mortgages and not an individual's homes, right? Um, the velocity of that deal flow has drastically picked up in multiples of available um, opportunity set to take a look at. Um, when mortgages default, commercial mortgages default in, in New York, they go to a 24% interest rate under the contract. So that's an example of um, an investment opportunity we're currently exploiting that has become drastically better because of the problems in New York City. If you look at the other side of that and see how the COVID experience combined with the high tax experience has affected another market, look at, um, let's say Palm Beach or other parts of Southern Florida. Um, I'm in a community down there, we have a little place with 1,100 homes in it in Palm Beach Gardens, okay? There's usually 40 or 50 for sale, it's about 5%, usually maybe even more for sale homes. Right now, and for the last year or so, there's under 10. There is virtually no inventory in those areas, okay? If you look at New Jersey, in counties close to New York, and you wanna sell your home, you'll sell it immediately. If you go down to Princeton, it's much harder. So one of the effects of the last year has been drastic demand in some areas 
and very significant fall off demand in other areas. And that's having a direct effect on the geography and the asset type of where our portfolio um, is being shifted to. So that's a direct link between a macro factor today and an actual allocation decision in real time. Yeah, I mean, that was great. I'm gonna actually get to your real estate holdings and specifically in New York and some of the challenges with multifamily housing, probably in a couple of more minutes once we start to dive into the actual asset allocations. I mean, if we were to listen to a lot of the so-called experts who I often have on, and they're colorful, uh, bear market, things that go in a hell in a handbasket, it's ironic, Marty, because a lot of them are not in the trenches. Boy, they keep on extending their timeline for the market to crash, how very convenient, and a broken clock is going to be right twice a day. If I listened to them last year, I mean, oh my God, I would have missed out on a great market. Now, in theory, in theory, the concepts they were talking about are correct, but the government keeps on printing, printing, and printing. This goes back to something created in 1988 uh, called the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, loosely and tongue-in-cheek called a plunge protection team. Of course, they want to prop things up. One, during the political run of the presidential race, it looks better. So part of that is driven by one party. And now the other party kind of wants to do the same thing. They don't want to go through the flushing out and kind of starting it over for lack of, for any other word. So trying to predict the markets, <laughs> it's, it's kind of whatever the plunge protection team wants it to be. And right now it's being propped up artificially or not. So like... Have you changed? We're going to get to more of the specific asset allocation shortly, but have you generally been invested or do you have more money on the sidelines, what I'm going to call cash and treasuries? Yeah, our, our asset allocation has been relatively constant. Um, we have five and 10 year investment horizons um, for many of the assets that we're in, especially real estate, especially VC. So we have not um, significantly changed the asset allocation as in terms of um, the possibility of a market crash or market timing. We, we don't, we know we can't do that. We're not good at it. Um, so the answer is that is not where the changes come in. The changes come in in terms of, do we emphasize one category over another category? And within a category, for example, of real estate, do we change the geography or the asset type? That's where the changes would be. Yes, very good points. Uh, any specific opinion on inflation? Are we going to go through a deflationary period, then inflation, hyperinflation? And I'm the believer inflation is very unique to people. As I've said, if I'm super rich and one of the people that buys homes in the Hamptons, New York, and Tokyo, I'm buying football teams, I'm buying more and more equities, those are skyrocketing up. My true inflation, in my opinion, could be really, really high, maybe 10 or 20%. So when the government tells me it's two or three percent per CPI, I'm I'm not buying that. It's very individ, individualistic. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, um, I don't know that you know. I'm not an expert in inflation. I don't know how they. There are many ways to measure it. I can tell you that. Um, uh, I'm told just in the last couple of months, the price of lumber has almost doubled. Right. I know there are my friends who are in PE who have. Who, who get stuff from China and other places, they said it's almost hard, you can't even find a container ship to ship it in. Yep. So there's very, very significant areas in which inflation is really popping. There's some areas in which it's going down, like the, the price of rentals in Manhattan has already seen significant drops. The price of homes and other, uh, and other um, you know, similar assets in other hot areas, red states has gone significantly higher. So there could be areas of deflation and areas of significant inflation. When you put them all together, they can average out to not that much. But clearly, it depends on where you are and which particular asset type you're in. And Marty, when you make decisions, let's stick to on behalf of your family office. Is this strictly, I believe, in an odd number of decision makers and it's less than three, meaning it's you? Or do you believe in family engagement, consensus committee, outsiders, a board? How do you do it? Um, it's the former. It's me. But, <laughs> um, but those decisions are made after I've had conversations with many people, right. which are ongoing all the time. So from a governance perspective, I'm the one who pulls the, who pulls the cord. Um, 
but you know, going to work every day is constantly an educational process where you're constantly talking to smarter people um, and you're just trying to get the best possible ideas um, about where you want to invest and with whom you want to invest. So I would say that the, it's not a governance situation at the moment. It's me, but it's not just my being waking up one day and having an idea. It's about a lot of talk with a lot of people we talk to in other family offices. Of course, of course. And let's talk a little bit about some of the allocations. And you mentioned it hasn't really changed much from when I last had a more public conversation with you last summer. Uh, but let's break it down. Uh, let's put cash and treasuries in the same bucket. Approximately, what's your allocation to that? Yeah. Well, I can take you through. It's essentially eight buckets. Okay, go Our for it. Our allocation is Let us buckets. know. The first is cash and treasuries. The return profile there is whatever the market pays us. Um, and it's a, pro let's call it right around 10%. Okay. The next bucket um, is long equity managers. Okay. Um, hope this adds up and we'll call that, we use three of them, we'll call that 15%. And the goal there, the, the goal of the cash allocation is to be there when we need it. And the goal of the equity allocation is to try to do if possible, a point or so better than the S&P. And do you have any international exposure? We have a little bit, but not a lot. Okay. We don't have a lot of international exposure or emerging market exposure. My view is that, um, uh, Angela, I already know how to lose money in America, and I don't have to improve my skills. <laughs> and okay. back to the back to the cash and treasuries. If you were right. to see, and I don't see it, but in theory, a deflationary environment, would you end up likely putting more money towards that? We would, but we don't see that. Right, I agree. Yeah, we don't see that. So those are those are the first two. The hedge fund allocation. These are approximate. We'll call that forty percent. Four okay. zero, and do you Four mean zero. And the main hedge reason, fund specifically, hedge fund managers. Yes, hedge fund managers, and there's about ten of them. The reason that that is is as high as it is, um, is because we've been with a couple of managers for twenty five years or more, who have been exceptionally good. Some of these people you'd see on the business channel, okay, um, and um, they've just done so well for us that we let that money ride, okay. In terms of the strategies that we use in the hedge fund space. Number one, we do not want to use leverage strategies because in a couple of weeks, you can lose your business like happened to people who were in leverage structured credit last March and April mm -hmm. um, of 2020. Um, they tend to be activist equity or distressed credit or activist credit managers. In addition to um, a couple of biotech managers who are long on the equity side and we expect significant volatility over time from our biotech managers as part of the part of the um, part of the nature of what they do. So cash, equity and hedge funds um, gets us to about 65%. Um, okay, let's stop okay. there for a second because yep. you have deep experience in the hedge fund world and you're very active. Uh, what happens if not applicable to all strategies, but in certain strategies, a lot of the managers become incredibly successful. Uh, they become asset gatherers. They get massive checks from pensions and institutions that want very little volatility. They want to cut the you-know-what off the, the swag manager, and they're looking for, you know, six, seven percent returns. Uh, what do you do? Because you're more of a taxable investor uh, when you think the manager is more of an asset gatherer, no longer going after alpha or great on the downside protection. Yeah, you know, I mean, we, you know, we redeem. You know, we, we don't, those aren't the types of managers that we would use. There are those types of managers out there. It is true that once a manager gets a decent track record um, and, uh, and gets good, a decent amount of capital, their main job is not losing the capital. So they know if they can do 11 as opposed to 15, they're going to keep the capital. So that phenomena you describe is definitely something that happens. When we see that, we try to pay a lot of attention. We try to know the managers and we try to not let that, um, let that happen to us. Yep, sim simply put. Great. And how about the next bucket you were going to bring up? Um, the, the next buckets um, are real estate. And that bucket is divided into two sub buckets. The first bucket in real estate are real estate funds. And the second bucket in real estate are direct investments property by property. Okay. So um, if we're at, uh, that's about 15%, they vary. 
So if we're at 10% cash and 15% equity, that gets us to 25. If we go to um, that, the, uh, the 40, so we're at 65. If we're at 15%, um, real estate divided between funds and um, direct investments were around 80. And then we and have to- let's stay in real estate sure. a second. Uh, yep. In terms of the funds, what type? Are they in warehousing, commercial, yeah. multifamily? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's three types and we define them by structure. What I mean by that is the first type are institutional allocators, okay? Um, you know, uh, a Blackstone or an Angelo Gordon or a service would be an example of institutional allocators, okay? And that means that some of the deals they find for themselves, um, and I know at least in two of those, they very often use local operators that they partner with. So they will allocate your money across geography, across asset types, and across many other local partners they will use. So institutional allocator is type number one. Type number two is directly investing with the local operator. Mm -hmm. So a local operator would be, this person does multifamily in the Northeast. This person does red state um, mobile homes. This person um, just does hospitality. Okay, this person does value aid in Southern Florida. Those are examples of operators that are, are identified by asset type and geography. So that's the second kind, okay? And the third kind um, are, um, are people who um, are what they call GP participation funds. So that's a local operator who instead of um, maybe raising a couple of hundred million dollars to buy, let's say multifamily in the Southeast, that's a local operator who will raise like maybe 50 or $60 million, let's say $50 million, okay? So let's say that's 5 million times 10. So that person can do 10 deals where he puts in $5 million and then they get another 45 million from one of the institutional allocators. So that's 50 million of equity. So it's 5 million from the GP fund. It's 45 from an institution and then they'll go get a mortgage. And then when that deal gets sold, our general partner will get a performance fee from the institutional allocator on right. its 45 million. And as a limited partner in his fund, we share in that performance fee in addition to making money on, the, on our capital that we invested. So that's, that's a quirk to a structure whereby we're able to add between three and 600 basis points over what we would expect to be, to be a mid-teen return on our own capital in real estate. So that's an example. Those are three different kinds of funds defined by structure that make up our real estate fund portfolio. And let me dive a little deeper, whether more directly or through the funds, you have some multifamily housing exposure, correct? Well, we have that in two ways. The first is we get it through the funds, but when it comes to the exposure we have in real estate that is property by property, right? Mm -hmm. Where we're making it one decision, um, the overwhelming percentage of those, inst of those investments are multifamily. Okay, let me ask a couple of things on that, and you probably know they're coming. Uh, there's a bit of a no-pay culture, and that is absolutely creeping up to the upper middle class to so-called people in the top 1% that may be renting. And I guess through federal regulation, and I'm not saying I necessarily completely disagree with it, I get it, we need help during these times. But from your perspective, if someone elects not to pay their rent and you can't kick them out, I mean, this must concern you holding properties in multifamily housing. Angelo, um, look, you're 100% correct. Um, in general, if we would have looked at our portfolio and said, what are our lowest risk investments? <laughs> you would have thought. We, we would have said huh? multifamily mm -hmm. with maybe 50 to 60% loan to value mortgages. Right. In good areas, we would have, that are producing substantial cash flow. We would have considered that one of our best um, upside investments as well as lowest risk investments. It's amazing what, what black swans could do. What COVID has done has introduced a level of political risk, for example, to what we thought were the most conservative and excellent investments we could find, like 
multifamily. So right. your point is extremely well taken. What the governors did when they said, if you do not pay your rent, you won't be evicted, even if you didn't lose your job, okay, was to essentially transfer my asset to the tenant during that period of time. They destroyed contract law, okay? What they didn't do, which is what they should have done, was to say, if you can't pay your rent, go talk to your landlord, explain you're on tough times, tell them a COVID relief package is on the way, so that when you pay your landlord, or he waits a little bit, okay, he can then pay his taxes. Notice the governors who said this didn't say, because you're not collecting rent, you're not gonna pay your taxes to me, okay? So we all know what this was about. It was really, really crazy in terms of what they did. I would, I would not be in favor of evicting the people. I would not wanna do that. But instead of telling them they don't pay the rent, they tell them to go work it out and help us on the way. This way you preserve contract, okay? One of the effects of that is it has had an effect on how much cash or treasuries we think we need to keep. Right. Because you never know, and this was a great example, you never know when you're gonna need cash reserves to preserve your continued ownership of assets you thought would be the last ones that would be endangered in terms of losing them to a lender. Now, Marty, so, if I could take just a pinch of a little different perspective to spark discussion. Uh, could I also say, okay, like I just brought up and you confirmed for sure, but can't you go to your lender and almost tell them the same thing? I'm not going to make a payment. And are they getting any government subsidies for the lender? Are you getting anything? And is this just a cycle that goes all the way around? Well, it's a great point. Um, and the answer is the following. Maybe. Definitely maybe, and here's why I say that. Um, in, in many cases, the lenders were being accommodative, especially right. hotels and other places. Okay, so lenders were being accommodative. That will not go on forever. They're no longer being as accommodative, especially when we talk to our private equity managers in real estate. <laughs> They're saying the accommodation happened, and it's reaching, it's reaching an end. The second problem is it depends who your lender is. For example, if you had always borrowed from the same local bank, okay, you are likely to have a receptive ear when you ask for some sure. forbearance or adjustment. If on the other hand, you bought a hotel or another piece of commercial property, and your mortgage is now part of a CMBS structure, ain't nobody to talk to. So in many cases, we know of situations where people have borrowed money commercially. It has been, this is for investments, not for their homes. It has been put into a commercial mortgage-backed securities pool, okay? And those pools do not have the same flexibility that individual lenders do. So many people have had very, very difficult times talking to their lender if they're in a CMB, CMBS pool as sure. opposed to a local bank. So yes, that's exact. Those are the nuances to what's been going on. And let's stay a little bit into New York City. When I spoke to you a couple of months ago, you were, although cautiously, you were like, hmm, there may be some interesting distressed opportunities in hotels. Uh, do you still feel relatively bullish about that? Have you pulled back or kind of neutral and waiting to see how prices drop? When you say we, um, I really have to answer on behalf of the managers that we invested in who invest in New York and hotels. Right, of course. A number of our managers um, actually told us about six months ago that the only place in the United States they will not invest in the hotel business is in New York City. And those were for political reasons. They simply could not figure out the politics. And um, to be fair to New York, I haven't asked them the same question in the last two or three months, but there right. were people that were so upset with the New York politics um, that they simply said that we will no longer allocate any dollars there. Okay, everything in the case of the hotels to the unions, everything else like that. 
So um, right now I can tell you that because we make a lot of loans in New York that we think are safe and have been very safe, I can tell you that um, in the last month or two, the renting activity in New York City has gotten a lot better. Right, that is true. Family. That has definitely picked up, okay? Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason it's picked up is because uh, many people wanna live in New York City, especially younger people, and it's gotten all of a sudden affordable given the change in the rents, the rent, the rent levels, okay? Um, we, there, in many instances, um, the managers are still not seeing a shrinking of the gap between um, what people want to sell their properties for and what the <laughs> buyers think they're worth. Now that will reality. change. Reality, yes. That's correct. So at the moment, um, the data points are significant increase in rental activity in New York City in the last month or two. Um, tourism will return. The real issue for New York if they could get the politics, even if they got the politics right, and even if the office market came back reasonably okay, the real question for New York is, are the rich gonna be in a 55% tax bracket? Or are they simply not gonna do that? And we'll know the answer to that going over time. <laughs> yes, it's we the will. Same thing as California. My friends run a major hedge fund in Los Angeles, okay? They just moved to Dallas, and they moved the firm to Phoenix. It was a couple of hundred people. You know the names, you read them in the paper of major New York companies that are open. I think it's public that Goldman Sachs is, is opening up a major wealth management division in, my, in Miami, right. okay? You, you know, I'm not telling anybody anything they haven't heard before. I mean, this is exactly what's happening. We don't know the magnitude of it. We don't know the velocity of it. And we don't know to what extent, you know, a new political leadership in New York will take steps to mitigate or reverse it. We got to wait and see. And you still have a couple of buckets we haven't discussed, probably mainly around privates, whether private equity or venture capital. Yeah. I'll let you continue. Sure. And, and quickly, we have a lending bucket. Oh, true. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's a bucket um, which basically makes between a, a nine and, and 12% um, on first mortgages backed by real estate in almost all cases. Um, and that's been very good for the tax, the, the, the tax exempt pools of dollars we have, as well as both for us and for our clients. Um, some of those are taxed at a, um, a REIT, a qualified dividend from a REIT. So it, it turns into about a 6% after, you know, a 6% municipal bond. So it's a 6% after tax payment, oh. which is pretty good if you're, you know, um, um, if you're, uh, if you're retired. Okay. The other, the other part of the lending is in, is venture lending. Okay. And we're making 12 to 15 plus percent loans, which are not really risky because in many cases, we're really factoring receivables from, um, you know, let's say at companies like Amazon and Facebook, okay, and others um, <laughs> for smaller companies, they want the cash now. And in other cases, we're lending to smaller companies that are, that are gushing with cash flow and they're using it to buy more businesses. And the only reason we're doing that level of lending is because we get, the, we get warrants and we get to see companies um, grow and we get a chance to invest in them. So the lending is really bucketed um, between the very conservative cash flowing real estate related lending of let's say nine to 12 or more on first mortgages um, in real estate. And the second is the, um, is the venture lending. Um, the other two buckets are private equity and venture. We're doing minimal amounts in private equity um, with one or two exceptions for the simple reason um, that uh, there's a huge amount of money chasing that space. And so we don't wanna be part of it. It's just, we think it's gonna be much harder there. So from what we're hearing from our private equity people, we're, we're pulling back on that a little bit. The other area where we've become much more active over the last five years um, is in venture. The big hindrance to doing this was my ignorance of that space. Um, in terms of working with other family offices, I've become less stupid. Um, and so we actually have a 14 manager venture portfolio and it's designed to accomplish a number of things. Um, the first is we wanna be in um, many different geographies. We wanna be in Europe, we wanna be in the United States and some of that in Silicon Valley and some in Boston and we wanna be in Israel because there are four very interesting VC ecosystems. We wanna be in first time funds, younger funds. We wanna be in older, more established funds. 
We want to be doing seed and A as well as pre-IPO. We want to touch all of the different business stages. We want to see sidecar opportunities. Um, five of our, six of the funds were like 15 basis point allocations just to get to know the managers and see which ones we wanted to do again. Yeah. So we are seeing very interesting opportunities in early stage venture, um, which we don't think are very risky. Now, someone says that's just counterintuitive when you say early stage venture. Ah. The, reason, the reason I say it's not very risky as we think about it is because if we're going into a fund that's gonna have 40 or 50 little seed investments, we think that the chance over the next four to five years of not at least getting our money back is very low. Clearly, we're not doing early stage venture to get our money back, right? But if it turns out that I had a three or 4% return, which clearly would not be a good return, and I ended up with the Muni return for testing a bunch of VC managers, that's, like losing, that's not the same as losing a lot of money. So we don't do um, we don't do one-off investments in venture for any material amount of money. We're basically diversified over a number of funds. And we've been very, very happy, very happy with some of the early stage funds we've done um, in terms of what we think are going to be very strong returns, where I'd say a four or five X um, is a little, nice. bit on the low, a little bit on the low side, because we're not doing a 10-year early stage fund for a four X. We're doing it for a lot more. And we've also been very fortunate in, an, and it's been a good market to do this. We've also been very fortunate in a number of sidecar opportunities. So early stage venture, especially if tax rates go up a lot, is gonna be one of the areas we're gonna be adding more money to. The other area we're gonna be adding more money to, if we have very significant increases in capital gains rates, is um, QOZ deals in real estate, qualified yes. opportunity zones. We've looked at a lot of those deals. We've done a few. We think the, a very significant percentage of them are not worth doing for a whole bunch of different sure. reasons. But we do think that if you look really, really hard, you can come up with some very interesting situations in that area. So to tie up a little bit of the portfolio reallocation due to the factors we've discussed um, that are kind of new in some cases in the last year or two, it's a little more of definitely looking at the higher capital gains tax rates go, the more we might put into long equity, intending to hold companies for a very long time. The mm -hmm. more of that um, would go into um, early stage biotech, for example, where we, we have five separate allocations um, where we expect to hold that for a very long time. The more would go into one-off real estate deals where we expect to hold for a very long time as well as qualified opportunity zones. Um, and because we think that there's a decent chance if I take a five or 10 year horizon, there's some possibility that if very high tax rates are put in now, they may not last because this stuff tends to be cyclical. <laughs> no kidding. So yes. Those are four examples of where exactly what we're looking at right now will have a direct effect on how we would tinker with our allocation, including right. probably increasing the cash book to maybe as much as 15%. Okay, some questions on that. So that is being tactical. And I've always said there's, when you make a thesis and a decision to get into an investment, you're generally gonna stay with it, unless for the most part, one of two things, the thesis is no longer applicable. And you're mentioning the tax case that may change it, or probably the biggest one, I think what I have over here is pretty good. I used to think it was good to great, but now it's pretty good. And I have a better opportunity over here. So both theses are good, but one is like maybe noticeably better. So I'm willing to move money out of one bucket and put it into another. You mentioned three to four areas where money could be going into, but Marty, that also means it must be coming out from somewhere. Are hedge funds going to take the hit? <laughs> no, not really. And the reason I say that is because the portfolio continues to generate cash. Oh, huh? true. Okay. Okay. And so the first question would be, where would the cash be redeployed to? Right. So a lot of the new investments won't necessarily be the result of having sold A to now invest in B. Okay. Um, they could be, um, to a very large extent, the redeployment of the cash generated from the portfolio. Okay. Now, generally speaking, when we buy apartments or invest in them, we never sell them. 
However, <laughs> there have been times, there have been times when particular properties have underperformed. And so that has happened. It wasn't because of the asset classes because of that particular property. Okay. But generally speaking, um, the changes I've been alluding to um, would to a large extent be paid for out of cash generation from the portfolio. And that, that includes not just distributions from assets, but as for example, um, venture capital funds go forward in time, we sure. start seeing some exits. And you did not mention uh, commodities, whether oil or gold specifically, whether directly through ETFs, through managers. Why? Uh, we don't. It's Why not? not? <laughs> it, it's, it's not our expertise. Okay. We, I mean, that actually, yeah. is a, that actually is a good answer. You're not yeah. saying it's necessarily a bad decision. It's where you feel no. you and your team and your internal resources don't have enough. Do you? Do you still just say, oh, you know, we'll do 50 basis points in a gold ETF or it's not even worth it? It's not worth it. Okay. We, we own commodities through the businesses we invest in because our, our various companies, we invest in different assets. So we're going to get some exposure there, but we don't want, um, we don't do any commodities on a pure basis. I think there was a famous, I think John Train wrote a book one time about commodity trading. He says, if you guarantee me, you'll keep doing it. I guarantee you, you'll eventually go bankrupt. <laughs> but, so it's just, not, it's just not our thing. If it doesn't produce cash flow, it, it's not just in general, it's not what we would do. And do any of the managers, I'm assuming perhaps in the uh, hedge fund bucket, uh, or do you specifically do any tactical shorting or do managers do long short? And they say they're long short, but a lot of them don't do much on the short. Yeah. Um, it depends on the manager. If we're involved in, um, I can actually use March as a good, last year's of 2020 is a good example. So we have long bias credit funds. Okay. That means that when markets have extreme events like 2008 or like 2020, those funds are going to go down. And they're going to go down because when credit markets go into extremists, money comes out demand disappears and marks go down. If you are levered, you may not live to fight another day. But if you are not levered, you hmm. will come back. So a typical port, um, profile for our long bias credit funds was you know, being down mid to high teens, maybe a bit more at the worst point in March and April and ending the year in many cases up 10 to 15%. If you were in a number of well-known funds that were in levered structured credit, you went down 50 to 80% and they liquidated the portfolio, okay? So if we're in a long bias credit fund and we're unlevered, we know we're gonna incur volatility in places like that. If we're in a long short credit fund, mm -hmm. which we are, and the manager did a great job. Last year, our manager was up in the 20s and he did not have a single down month. Okay, we have other managers that are very large managers, you know who they are, that are always hedged and that manager was down about 50 basis points in March and did the year up around 10 or 11. And we have other managers who are traders, another person who's well known, um, who, based on his judgment, at some point in time, will decide to take all the risk out of his portfolio under conditions when he thinks it's merited. This particular manager, um, uh, lost about one and a half percent in March and then did the year up 10 or 12. So, wow. um, so depending upon the strategy of the manager, some will always hedge, some will never hedge, and some will tactically hedge depending upon what their strategy is. So those were three or four different examples that we had in our portfolio in last year, um, which did what you suggested to different degrees. And I think you would have mentioned it, but I'll ask it anyway, tail risk managers. Some believe, listen, put in 50 basis points, 1%, it's gonna get me nothing, but the broken clock is right twice a year, maybe once every 10. You froze on me. Oh, now you're back. Oh, yes. Uh, you froze on me for was, a second. Do you have, no. oops. We're not getting a great internet connection. Uh, I have do no you have tail any risk exposure managers. to tail risk managers. No. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think my last question, uh, what's the balance between enough diversification to too much where you may be dampening returns? Yeah. Um, it's something we think about a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the allocation we have is pretty institutional so that if yes. you went to a major endowment, um, our cash at 10% might be a little bit higher. Our 15% at long equity is probably a little bit less. Some of those many institutions would have a little bit more international. They might have probably less in, in hedge funds than we do. Some will, others will not have venture. Most will have private equity. Most will have real estate. Um, and very few will probably have any lending. Okay. So we look at each of those buckets as um, generating a certain return profile. The cash is very little. We don't worry about diversity there. We have three equity managers. Um, that's not too many. We have about 10 hedge fund managers. Um, again, we're the first thing we're trying to do is never have never be poor again. Okay. So <laughs> if we make if we make 10% one year, when the next guy makes 12% one year, so what? We'll make the next two percent and more the next year. We're not in a race. We're in trying right. to be, you know, very cautious and sensible in what we do. Um, if I was in fifty different venture funds, that would be ridiculous. Okay, right. I was in fourteen for tactical reasons. I wanted to watch six smaller ones, knowing that next round I wouldn't be doing six. Yeah, that so was it, yeah, it's a balance we think about. Um, we don't think we're over diversified. There's no one position that's going to make us a gigantic amount of money on the portfolio, you know, but we're, um, we're not managing a battleship, but we're also not managing a canoe. Okay. Um, and so we, we think about that question. We try to be kind of reasonable about it. Um, we have, you know, I don't know, a large number of one-off apartment deals. So we do, they are sold every now and then. We don't think too many is too many there. We don't think, you know, if it were, if it were, you know, 70 as opposed to 15, we wouldn't think that's a problem. Right. And yeah. Marty, as we're wrapping up, for those that enjoyed you being so open and honest in your conversation and your way of investing. Now, again, Marty's also a generational family member, active in running and making the decisions for his own capital, which is substantial in his family office, but has been a professional investor for a number of years with some tremendous LPs from the institutional and family office community. For those that would like to learn more, how could they learn more and potentially even reach out to you? Sure, well, thank you. We have um, um, about 300 clients that invest with us. We do have funds. Um, they are not just in the hedge fund area. Um, they are in the other asset classes we described. Um, Anyone can reach out to me either through you or my email is mjg, that's Mark Jack George, mjg at sandalwoodsecurities.com. Sandalwood is S-A-N-D-A-L wood, securities, plural, all one word, dot com. And you're free to give anyone my cell number if they would like to ask you for it. So that's, that's what we do. We've been doing it since 1990, um, running our fund of hedge fund business, which has evolved into... Uh, putting clients into all of these other asset classes. And the only time we show anything to a client is when our dollars go first with a first investor. So we're not, shall we say, brokering off a platform. Um, we're simply investing our own capital and families that have been working with us for years. If they like the investment, then they come and invest alongside us. That's been great. It's always a pleasure, Marty, to talk to you, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles, the host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the founder and CEO of Family Office Association. Go to familyofficeassociation.com to learn more. You can also follow us on Instagram, same company name, Family Office Association, and our YouTube platform, which has been really exciting for us. Simply, it's Family Office or Family Office Channel. You'll find it. Marty, again, thanks for coming on. Look forward to the next time, hopefully this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for having me, Angela. It's always great interacting with you. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks, it's Mark. It's terrific. Thanks again. Thank you.